Hey, Daniel, thank you for coming in. You have such an amazing background, you know, Forbes under 30 uh, nominee, LinkedIn, uh, Social Impact Talk Voice. You, so you're a serial entrepreneur. You, you got this, uh, uh, you know, this platform called Tech to the Rescue. You know, doing some amazing work and we have uh, people in common as well. So thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with my audience. Yes, thank you for um, the invitation, Stephen. I admire your work uh, and contribution to the uh, Tech for Good community. So I'm, I'm here uh, to share some of my uh, knowledge and also uh, be of help. So uh, Daniel, you, you've got this wonderful career and you're, you, you're such an amazing contributor to Global Good. What were those uh, seminal moments in your life, those magic moments that it could have been when you're three or five years old, could have been inside the family, outside the family, mentors, and uh, different things, uh, things that happened when you were at school or uh, perhaps uh, early career moves that created you who you are today? I think um, going back to the past, I think... Uh, those were uh, relationships, the early relationships that I that I built with some of my closest family members and friends. I think one of the most important um, uh, people in my life was my grandmother, uh, who passed away a couple of years back. Uh, but uh, she spent a lot of time with me when I was uh, uh, three, five. And uh, she was actually the one that uh, contributed to teaching me how to read and spent a lot of time showing me the world, uh, traveling a little bit. Uh, so uh, that was, you know, the, the, the probably one of the first early memories that I have of somebody that really uh, created my uh, openness, that the world is, you know, uh, consisting of many interesting uh, things, places to visit. And that actually sparked my, um, I would say, um, curiosity to uh, explore it, uh, to meet people and to have faith that there are such incredible people like my grandma uh, out there that I should probably meet. And yeah, I think that was one of the first. And then there were many uh, other forming um, situations some of them were good uh, and positive. Some were, some of them were uh, tough. Uh, but you know, I think from the very early days, I had that feeling that uh, I'm a part of something bigger, and uh, I can contribute just being a good person, as my grandma was. So that's a really you know heartfelt story of your a narrative. You know, your grandmother inspired you to be the person you are today, and. And uh, you know, doing things for the betterment of the world. Let's kind of go chronologically now into your past. I mean, uh, what did you study in school? What were the things that interested you prior to, like uh, you know, uh, from K to twelve, kindergarten to grade twelve, or equivalent? Uh, were you interested in the arts, the sciences, humanities? Uh, you know, what what really, uh, you know, took your time? I think. Um... What really, um, what's what what I really found interesting was the fact that I always was interested in in in, in many different subjects. Even at school, um, uh, one of my favorite uh, subjects was uh, history, and then yeah. the other one was what math, you know, mathematics. So uh, it was um, not a typical thing because my teachers were saying that well, usually it's one or the other. And in my case, I really enjoyed, you know, uh, first and foremost, learning about concepts. And then probably a, a huge uh, role in, 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 you know, the interest and curiosity had, again, those people like uh, teachers that I had. I, I love my uh, first uh, math teacher uh, who was pretty tough, but also very... Um, good in teaching mathematics, uh, very demanding, but also very uh, meritorious. Uh, so I, I got a lot of good quality education, uh, even though my, my my city was a small city uh, in, in Poland, uh, about 100,000 people. So it's like a small, medium, 
city in, in, in the country. But then, you know, history was also one of the subjects that was always something uh, that I treated as the, you know, window to the past that was giving some insights on how to actually look at the future. So, you know, that mix of history and, and what's the legacy of humanity and, uh, you know, some um, first, uh, I would say, hypothesis, what can happen in the future, uh, and then mathematics. So, you know, concepts, frameworks, and structuring the knowledge. I think that that was the mix that was really something that I found super interesting. And then that was something that really for also the way how I continue my education later in the future. So uh, it's interesting, the interest in history, but in mathematics and, and uh, so the, uh, you enjoy reading, but you enjoy doing sort of uh, modeling the world in essence through mathematics, because everything can be modeled in some way. And that's sort of the foundation of everything. And then, and then uh, what did you do post high school? Yeah, post high school, I, I was struggling a little bit. I think, um, you know, it's it's always the moment when you're a little bit pushed by the system to you know what you want to do in life. And mm -hmm. I knew that I want to learn about concepts. I want to learn about the world. And I really didn't know how should I narrow that interest into something very specific. I was always more a generalist. Uh, I even laughed some time ago, but because one of my friends called me a professional generalist, but uh, I always was, you know, um, interested in, uh, well, why I should uh, really choose. But at some point, obviously, the, there was uh, a decision to be made. And I think what uh, uh, really pushed me to to uh, the subject that I uh, really enjoyed during my study uh, was um, that curiosity of the world. And, and finally, I, I ended up going into uh, a, a subject that was connected between economics and international relations. Uh, I realized that there is something that connects history and math again. And um, the choice wasn't that trivial and, and easy, but at some point after you know a couple of years moving forward, I think um, I realized that that was really a valuable experience because um, international relations was also you know it, it consisted of a little bit of business aspects and economy pieces. Those were giving me the, the overview on how the markets work and you know what we can um, forecast or expect from, you know, different uh, speculations or, or, or uh, changes on, on the stock exchange and, and you know, in, in, in the world in general. So um, that was incredibly uh, satisfying because I was learning about various pieces that were giving me that overview on what is, what is going on in the world. And also, I had a chance to meet people from other parts of the world, uh, international relations, especially that that part. I think it brought pe people from different parts of the world coming to to study uh, in in my uh, city where where I chose to study, which was Krakow, Poland. And um, it was a great experience because people were sharing their you know very specific regional perspective as well as some of the context of how their politics works, how you know the situation in their region works. Uh, and those are people from different continents uh, that, that came and I wanted to study. Um, so I think that was really valuable because getting that perspective uh, of what is going on in the world and you know having the dialogue with, with other people gave me that understanding that there are so many puzzle pieces that influence our life, that it's worth just following and trying to stay up to date what, what is what is going on. So you, you have this abiding interest in different cultures and people, international relations and so on. And then how did you get involved in tech and how did you get involved in entrepreneurship? I think 
it was um to to make this story short it was a little bit of um uh curiosity luck uh coincidence which i don't believe there was any coincidence i think it, the world is you know there's no never a coincidence but let's call it for for this conversation uh, as in um you know uh, an organization of different um uh, initiatives and situations that came into a moment that um i ended up um going actually not not uh, i i i got sick i didn't go to one class of uh, analytics or or uh, statistics i think and when i went to my teacher to actually catch up and and understand uh what's the material i should uh prepare for the next classes uh the teacher shared that oh you know there's actually that workshop um that i forgot to announce to students uh and it's happening next week and it's a you know it's 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 um, a, outside of the city so there is a hotel and then there is some great uh, people that are coming as teachers um could you help me to you know get other people to to come and i'm like yes i mean of course who wouldn't want to do that um so it was uh, you know a little bit of that situation that uh it you know we went for the tra- travel the trip and and um i met some of the first people that started introducing me to the concept of you know that technology as a uh business uh is something that uh, connects you know different perspectives of people it connects uh, that look into the future it connects maths uh, and also you know sciences and at that point i felt that it is a little bit uh, um you know um so so my first connection with technology was when i was about 12 or 13 years old and one of my friends came over and he said you know what there is something that is called uh, uh, um, uh, uh, like web de- development and it's actually about uh, you know creating uh, uh, designs on that interesting thing which is called internet uh, and other people can use it and you know you can create things and then uh, see how it changes over time and you can add to it and so on and uh he also brought uh a book uh the basics of php uh which at that point was one of the uh booming technologies and uh, i guess now people who know technology already start to think oh okay i know what time it was what year it was um but um the the truth is that we built some of the first websites with that friend of mine and we made a um, significant amount of money for somebody who was 12 or 13 year old yeah. and at that point my i think my mom came and she said oh you spent too much time you know uh on on this uh, no matter that there is money involved but you should be studying you should be playing outside you should you know do some sports uh, i think you you shouldn't be doing this anymore so i actually reminded myself when uh, you know that first opportunity to meet the technology world appeared that oh my god maybe that's the going back to that curiosity of creation and and using technology to solve some problems right so i got my first job uh, in a startup through a person that i met at that workshop that i traveled to with my for you know uh fellow students and it wasn't just an internship where i started to learn um you know basics of marketing i was doing basically a piece of everything as usually people do in the you know very early days of forming a startup and it was very simple to me i mean i, I felt like that's the thing that i'm learning super fast i had good background on mathematics on on science i am learning fast and i'm interested in people and also in in you know the international 
a business. So it felt like that's a connection, that's a match. And that's how I got that first job in the technology startup. So um, on that entrepreneurial journey, um, how did that progress from the first technology startup into, into you know, subsequent work in, in the entre uh, entrepreneur space? So I, I think that early um, experience, uh, uh, the, the fact that I actually um, started working for somebody when I was already 19, because that first, first job was when I was still studying and I was studying full time, and then I got that internship, uh, made me to actually think, how am I going to deal with that? Like I have a full time uh, studies, and I have you know um, an internship that requires some time for me, and you know it really made me to think how to organize my time and and how to really manage uh, myself well. But then also working for somebody else and looking at those you know mistakes that may be, might be made, uh, it really helped me to um, learn the 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 uh, lessons of what not to repeat at the very early age. And I think it was very helpful because with every other business that I got involved into, I already had some kind of um, basics and and base of what not to repeat or what what to actually implement in, in the next one. Um, and I, I think the interesting thing is that uh, Tech to the Rescue, uh, the, the, the current organization that uh, uh, I co-founded and, and uh, lead is um, actually the, the fifth uh, uh, startup, so to say, uh, that uh, I was involved into. Um, and only right now, it's it's the time when I feel that all those lessons that I got from those previous businesses or working for other people made me, you know, enough confident to say that, you know, things are really um, falling into the right place and, and everything starts to work well. We also, you know, are, are expanding right now, doing work in uh, over 70 countries. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, that was that was the the secret sauce was to learn from other people's mistakes, and I think uh, start pretty early and then not give up because um, there were probably three out of those five uh, startups that uh, I co-founded or or uh, was early uh, employee at. Uh, they they no longer exist. They died. Uh, one is doing like uh, so so, and and then Step to the Rescue is doing very well. So I think it was that you know um, uh, I would say passion for not giving up and pushing no matter what. And uh, I think there is also one additional factor that I think is worth uh, mentioning that only when I started uh, creating Step to the Rescue, I finally felt that I'm following my passion and doing something that really like really excites me uh, that I didn't feel, feel before. I mean, I felt excited about working on those other projects in the past, but this one was way bigger than myself. And that made me feel, you know, really motivated to, to, uh, to build it and push through uh, ups and downs. So you, you've got this um, history of entrepreneurship, and so you know what works and what doesn't. So what makes for a startup that doesn't work, and what makes for a startup that does work? Yeah, I think um, there are a couple of things, and obviously um, the, the, the first lesson is that, uh, and it's unfortunate or maybe fortunate, that different things work for different businesses. Uh, that was the first thing that I learned that uh, not, you know, the things that work for one business will not work for the others. Um, but also probably one of the most important lessons uh, from what works is that um, the the focus is really the key. I mean, there are so many different ideas and options that your business could really consider. 
uh, there are so many different paths that you could be, you know, testing or, or running in your organization when you start a, a, a business or a startup. That I think it's it's really um, tempting, like to get and try everything, especially if you have a curious, you know, mindset and then you would like to uh, search and check all of them, but. The, the key is to actually really dig deep into what makes sense and what is the the value that you want to provide what is the value that is actually going to make you you know an advantage over others um, and uh, just focus on it like really uh, focus on the work delivery you know the the uh, results and test those hypotheses and and then choose the next step, the, the, the direction that you should stick to. Um, if you, you know, I, I love that one uh, uh, science uh, visual that I had in my one of my books uh, uh, that represents uh, a, um, a, um, a ball. And then there are different, you know, uh, directions where the, uh, energy, uh, which direction the energy could take, right? And if you see those, the energy that you need to use to move the ball into different, if you uh, have those arrows showing the directions and you would choose five, the arrows, you know, will have a certain uh, um, a charge and it will have also a certain uh, length, right? You can move only a certain uh, a distance, but if you actually um, get all those arrows and directions, and you add one on top of the other and choose one direction, you know the the way that you can make the distance you can make with the same energy is way bigger, right? And I guess this is what science taught me about entrepreneurship that that you know you with the same energy you can go way uh, farther if you only make sure that you choose one direction. So uh, a big lesson for you is that there isn't one sort of model that fits everything. So you've got to make sure your, your model, your business model and your problem solution fit and your product market fit really fit the particular area that you're directing your energy into. And you've got to focus. So as you indicated, there's a tendency for people to, who are you know really curious to think of many different angles but you really have to refine on what your value is and focus on that value delivery to the people that are going to pay for that service or want to engage with you. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you, you indicated earlier that resilience and, and have, have not giving up and persistence <clears throat> makes a difference because you've done this many times, right? And you learn, learn lessons from each one of those times and you take those lessons forward. Uh, but the thing is, you have to be uh, resilient, right? You have to be agile and um, be willing to work really, really hard. What, I, what I think, was... Yeah, go I, ahead. I think one last thing to, to be added here is that it, it really, really depends also on the people that you surround yourself with. I know this; those are all truisms that I'm, that I'm saying and, and it might be applied to so many you know, areas in your life, but... Uh, realistically, um, I, I think many of those uh, past um, businesses uh, didn't work out well or worked so-so, uh, mainly because those people that I work with didn't have that focus or uh, because um, the people that uh, I uh, co-create Tech to the Risk right now, they have that mindset of really being... Um, very strict about what we want to achieve and really pushing with that idea. And then having people that can challenge your ideas. Like, you know, we had that conversation the other day, uh, Stephen, and even, you know, you and me knowing each other for a little bit of time, but then, you know, uh, receiving some of the first initial feedbacks that uh, I got from you about what Tech to the Rescue does, what it could do. I think, you know, all those insights that, an entrepreneur can gather from people who already done that before, this is invaluable. And then having, you know, an advisory board or uh, uh, somebody to challenge your thinking 
uh, it, it still, I think, helps you to stick to the direction that you chose and really focus on, on, on you know, one path. So what, what inspired you to found uh, um, and be the executive director of Tech to the Future or Tech to the Rescue, I should say? Yeah. Um, so I think um, it was um, several things that came together. So one thing was that I was really, um, um, I had that experience in the past working for uh, different associations uh, as a volunteer. So um, I, I really, from my early teenage world, I was involved in you know helping other people, uh, being a, a volunteer at, in associations that were fundraising funds for uh, some good cause. And um, I've seen that people are doing great things and help others with just, you know, driven by the, the, a goodwill of, of theirs. And uh, it became a part of my life that I got involved into volunteering and supporting, you know, initiatives that I believed in. And then another part was that I spelled, spent over 10 years in, in working in those, on those businesses and I was forming, co-creating startups and or, or working in software development. And I saw how technology can really um, solve problems like beyond you know anything that you can think of uh, about technology i the, the first um uh, description of technology for me was a, a tool to solve needs or, or address needs and solve problems and you know after those 10 years working in, in technology i was already a little bit tired of all the commercial implementations and you know building yet another app that was making more people rich, uh, which at the core is not a bad thing, but I was really searching for something that would make me um, again excited and, and interested in, in um, what I'm doing. And um, when uh, one thing that I, that really influenced me was when I met, um, I think it was 2014, probably I met. Uh, El Amade, um, who was a Polish entrepreneur uh, who uh, founded a company that was acquired by Zendesk a couple of years later. And then she moved to San Francisco and, and started a, um, a venture fund called 50 Years, 50 VC. Um, what, she, what 50 Years was doing and is still doing is um, it, it supports startups that not only make money, but also make profit, uh, but not, not only make a profit, but also make impact. And um, when we met a couple of years later, and I think it was 2017 or 18, she asked me that question. Um, so you're still working in software, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are, aren't you tired of this? <laughs> Is like, you know, and, and that was that moment when I really felt yeah, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm tired. Maybe I'm missing something. And we had that conversation about what fifty years was doing, and I immediately, you know, decided that I would like to explore how technologies, not only you know, uh, make profit but also contribute to uh, improving the world or you know, solving some of the most important problems that we face. And. Um, I worked with 50 years for, for some time, um, but then when the pandemic hit, that was the day when um, I actually felt like that's the, the world falling in front of my face and there has to be something that I can do. And the first thought that I had was, oh, I know quite many owners of tech companies and I know that you know because of the uh, reality that everyone was moving into digital because of pandemic restrictions, I felt like these people might soon become even more powerful in many ways and and hold you know keys to the uh, power that that will run the the world in the next couple of months or years. 
um, beyond the fact that obviously technology and IT industry was, you know, for many years doing great and, and influencing the world so much. So I think because of that past experience with volunteering and my uh, background in, you know, uh, technology and business, I felt like, why don't I use that skill of, you know, connecting those two worlds? Because I understood both the, the social uh, area and then in the world of technology, I felt, okay, I think this is the right time to actually um, connect these and form something that would last and, and not only help people during the pandemic, but also maybe help people in general. And I started looking into what exists and what doesn't exist. And I realized that there were quite a few organizations that are into education about technology, you know, that are connecting or, or bringing the uh, materials, educational materials to nonprofits or organizations that serve society. Um, I also saw that there are already organizations that are providing uh, subscriptions of products that a nonprofit can sign up and receive and then use. But when I started connecting with some of the first nonprofits uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, what I clearly heard from them was that, look, we are now in the chaos. We are trying to you know, help people. And we got those products. We, we know that you know, there are materials that we could learn how to use technology or you know, we have one engineer or two engineers working in, in the organization, but it's not enough. Like we need probably five or 10 more to be able to, to you know, uh, actually boost our uh, effectiveness. So what I clearly understood was that the, the one of the biggest bottlenecks was the access to uh, professional technologists, to people that know how to build solutions and would be available at the glance. And, you know, I think that was something that we started nurturing. And then we realized that there is, you know, huge gap in access to professional technology services. It's not only, you know, technology services of, you know, freelancers or after hours workers who are doing tremendous work. And without them, many organizations wouldn't do anything but like access to high quality organized teams that will come, you know, as a unit, get your idea. And within a short period of time, just give you an additional boost. And that was something that I shared the belief in with my co-founder that I met at that time. And we felt like, okay, I, we should do that. We, we should be pushing forward and, test if this really is a case. And yeah, it was. So what I <clears throat> excuse me. What what I'm hearing is is that uh, there's a lot of nonprofits out there that have to use technology or technology can scale their operations, uh, help them succeed in their nonprofit goals. And then there's uh, tech companies out there that have all sorts of resources and capabilities. So why not partner between those uh, tech companies or individuals out there who have all of these tech skills to work on pro bono projects for nonprofit organizations or organizations that don't have the funding to be able to have a team of tech, tech experts and then you'll advance uh, social impact through technology. So you're combined, you're really acting as the go-between between between those with skills and those uh, who need, have the need of the skills to work on projects for social good. And that's tech to the rescue. And now on tech to the rescue, um, you know, what are some examples, use cases you have of nonprofits or UN organizations or NGOs, et cetera, that you're supporting? And then on the on the expertise side, who are some of the providers of that expertise? Yeah, so um, important thing to say is that um, since uh, the pandemic, when we when we started, uh, it's been already over. Uh, uh, it's 
already uh, about 1,000 projects that we made it possible to be started. So last year, we uh, um, that it was the year when we enabled uh, the 700th uh, project uh, since the beginning. And uh, it was a partnership uh, between, you know, yet another great company that decided to come and, and support a nonprofit in building a uh, web technology uh, for, for them. Um, the, the spectrum of the projects is very varied. Those are, you know, small uh, implementations of, you know, a tweak in, in an existing, uh, you know, mobile app, or it's a development of, of a website, or it's, you know, sometimes a couple of hours of cybersecurity audit that is being done by some of the experts from our network, or it's a couple of months uh, about you know 1000 human hours of implementation that uh, is being done by a whole team from a company that you know invests into impact through involving you know uh, those couple of people uh, people's time to deliver a solution so various projects and i think what is the coolest is that you know, those companies come and as you said, they offer their time pro bono. And I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's pro bono, but we also calculate how much they invest into the project, how much the consultancy services would normally cost. Because what we do is ultimately we unlock, you know, resources that were not available before on the market. They might have been on the market, but nonprofits would either have problems affording them or they would be, you know, struggling to actually find a verified, a quality organization to actually help them. So what we do is we speed up the process, we verify the tech companies, and then those services that we deliver up until now were worth uh, of about $10 million in total. So, you know, um, it's quite a lot, but also is not enough because the gap in in needs uh, uh, of technology that could help solve some of the most pressing problems faster is tremendous. It's, you know, I think Bill Gates mentioned uh, uh, some time ago, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago, that the gap in access to resources, especially funding to cover, you know, the, the needs of meeting the sustainable development goals was uh, I think $15 trillion. And when we do count that there is a, you know, only a friction that would be spent on technology, it's, you know, we are talking about millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are needed to, you know, make a, a big, big uh, leap or difference for those organizations that work on solving, you know, some of the greatest challenges that the humanity faces and the planet faces. So, yeah, I think right now um, it's it's really about it, uh, tech to the rescue, about making sure that there is a right partnership happening, and that you know we use the uh, uh, skills and, and access to the talent from the tech companies that come to us, um, and match them with the right organization that has the potential to uh, do more with technology. And you also have the Tech to the Rescue Foundation. So what's the difference between Tech to the Rescue and the Tech to the Rescue Foundation? Yeah, I, I think um, I would want um, everyone to probably think about it as one unit because Tech to the Rescue is treated as a platform, like, a, like an online marketplace where you know tech companies can sign up and, and basically offer their time uh, and, and skills. And then on the other side, there is a whole process of scouting or verifying incoming needs of organizations. And I think Tech to the Rescue as, as a concept was initially, you know, that matchmaking platform where um, the, you know, both sides could meet. But then, you know, we from the beginning uh, were, um, uh, we, we set ourselves 
as a nonprofit. And we wanted really to make sure that uh, the the access, the democratic access to technology is possible for everybody. So we wanted to be a nonprofit to create as little boundaries for any nonprofit to come and get help, as well as create as, you know, the least possible boundaries for um, tech companies to get involved. Because, you know, a company, if 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 uh, it signs up to make a deployment of technology and spends you know tens or hundreds of hours working on a pro bono case, it invests you know thousands of dollars uh, into doing something good, into using their best skills to help. Um, and you know, then uh, I think uh, what happens is that um, we as Tech to the Rescue want to make sure that. These boundaries are, you know, uh, uh, as low as possible, and that's why we decided to be a foundation and basically to be uh, an organization that uses our platform, the uh, matchmaking uh, piece, as you know, something that creates lots of value. But then also to be a foundation and be a nonprofit that, you know, searches for resources, searches for funding. To en- you know, enable those connections to actually happen. Do you do reporting then back to the, or are there tracking and converting into sort of dollars or other other kind of measures when a a group and it could be an organization or a tech company says, you know what, we're we're going to do pro bono support for these organizations, and we're going to do it in this way, and we're going to do it by providing products and services. Is there some way of tracking what that is so you can assign some monetary value to it and then they can use that in their yearly reporting, for example? Yes, I mean, you should probably be a, a higher to our sales teams because you cracked it very, very well. Um, no, but the, the the truth to be said, it's, it's exactly what we do. Like we um, measure not only you know the spendings and the dollars invested so obviously there is a procedure where we uh, allow you know those who sponsor our activities to look through how much we enabled how many connections happened what was the value of those projects what those projects were what sdgs they come from right uh, so what what is the the solution or what, what are the solutions about and obviously they receive it in our uh, reports that we deliver to to them. It's also available on our website. Uh, so anybody can actually have a look into it. Uh, I strongly recommend anybody to look for Impact Report for 2023. Amazing stuff there. And I'm, I'm so proud of the whole team that, that work on that. Um, but also besides the, the monetary aspect and that you know multiplying effect, because what we do is we receive funds from uh, sponsors that enable those connections, but then those connections are, you know, worth some amount of money. I mean, the, the services that I provided cost, you know, in average about $35,000, $40,000. So we think that, you know, beyond showing the those who support us, you know, how much they invested and how much, you know, it multiplied through the value that we created from those uh, partnerships, we also measure, you know, um, uh, the the what's the progress of those organizations that we supported thanks to technology, or you know how were they able to improve as an organization, uh, so that you know now they can do more. I mean, you know, sometimes it's about those changes that are little, but if an organization helps, let's say, five hundred thousand children. And you improve their effectiveness uh, for about you know five or ten percent, which is already a lot. You can see you know impact on thousands of lives, which is great. So we also have something that we we call impact measurement, and uh, this is you know actually covering the part of making sure that we analyze uh, you know what was that influence uh, and uh, how many beneficiaries we were able to influence more thanks to technology in those organizations that we have. Right. So you're able to quantify the the sort of financial 
contribution through services and use of products and uh, products and so on. And you're also able to quantify the social impact that it's having. So you're you, the both sides of the equation, right? You're st- because pro bono is not really pro bono because that's people's time and expertise. And they're using tools and products that are embedded in their organizations to help another organizations, which cost the provider of those services money. It's, it's actually a financial contribution locked into the products and their services and their labor and skills they're providing. Exactly. Which normally, for example, if you hired somebody like McKinsey or Accenture would be, it could be in the hundreds of thousands or even the millions of dollars. And then on yeah. the on the NGO side or, or the pro bono project side, um, you have some measurable gain that that organization is having. And, and you can measure that gain and then the impact it's going to have on the broader community and to their their missions and goals. So you're able to then measure the, the social footprint and you're also able to measure the benefit to the corporation in their um, you know, ESG work, their environmental, social and governance work, right? So. Yes, no, it's it's exactly like this. And I think um, we worked with, uh, you know, um, already uh, thousands of nonprofits reviewing their needs, trying to connect them with the right partner. And we know that, you know, when we go and try to verify their impact, it's also, you know, a huge struggle for every one of them to be very, very, you know, specific and uh, accurate. And, you know, I just want to say that measuring impact is very specific per organization. And also, it's not that trivial, obviously, because, you know, uh, how every organization uh, could, you know, always be uh, super direct and accurate about every single life that they help. I mean, we know that it's hard and we learn that lesson ourselves and we learn from working with those nonprofits. And we know that, uh, you know, that tracking and uh, reporting is a crucial part of actually providing the conclusions and understanding if, you know, the work is going in the right direction or not. So, um, yeah, this is, this is I think, super important for any nonprofit, any organization that works on impact. So you've got in your tech to the rescue platform, you've got two um, entities, right? The providers of the services, uh, the products, and so on, and the labor. And then you've got the entities who have need for this to do social impact in their mission and their goals. And you have the ways to measure them. You have ways to onboard them. And and that matchmaking process, then, do you have some kind of AI in, embedded in there? Or is it uh, a decision tree? Is it autom- To what degree is that matchmaking automated? Yes, this is uh, uh, automated to some degree. Uh, we are building right now and uh, and fundraising to be able to uh, develop our own technology that is, in, you know, implemented into our decision making process and the matchmaking process. Uh, we built and created some algorithms and simple uh, um, um, tools that are allowing us to, you know, shorten the time of uh, connection and and. We are also obviously doing uh, uh, major m- many different uh, ways of, to map out, you know, those uh, data points that we can later on, um, uh, you know, try to uh, verify and connect based on some criteria. Uh, so right now, uh, our platform is um, uh, using some of our internal uh, scripts uh, that we created. But then uh, we also uh, learned throughout the time, uh, and this is what we do. We use uh, the the human in the process consciously. Uh, We have a whole team of uh, matching managers that are using those algorithms and tools that provide them with some suggestions. But then there is a whole set of uh, incredible people that are sitting down verifying what they receive and then they go and try to uh, make sure that both sides that were suggested by the algorithms uh, talk to each other and understand each other because that was something that struck us very hard Uh, in the world where two uh, you know uh, realities meet 
the reality of, oh, we want to make impact, we want to help people, and the reality, oh, we are building solutions, we are engineers. So there is, you know, that mind of engineer and mind of uh, someone that thinks about humanistic, uh, you know, aspect of, you know, the world and, and how to help, there is sometimes translation needed in between. And that's why we made sure to keep the people in the process because even if the technology would make the perfect match, you know, there is never that guarantee that two people will actually like each other, that there will be connection, that they will actually speak same language. And I think somebody made that comparison to us uh, to to tech, of tech to the rescue to you know one of those uh, dating tools like Tinder or or something like and you know they called us uh, Tinder for nonprofits uh, with tech companies. Um, the fact is that Tinder you know the the uh, you know technology driven uh, solution is only giving you some uh, suggestion. But then what happens is you need to make that connection. You need to actually, you know, check if if there is a click, the chemistry. And Tech to the Rescue is that additional secret sauce, you know, that bit in between technology and humanity. So we try to make sure that those two sides speak the same language and we try to navigate so that, you know, as many partnerships are successful as possible. And only with technology, I think we learn that it's extremely hard and there are more uh, challenges. Um, but obviously, if we want to help thousands of nonprofits, we need to scale our operations. And we, we, we know that technology will be an important part of this. Well, it's a fascinating story. I, I can see how uh, many people would want to support this journey, this narrative you have for Tech to the Rescue. And of course, your foundation as well. Tech to the Rescue uh, Foundation, which is sort of the entity that allows all of this to occur, uh, the legal entity to allow all of this to occur. Um, we're in the remaining minutes, uh, about two minutes left in our, our chat. So I'm gonna ask you the final question. And, and this final question is, what recommendations or questions do you wanna leave the audience? Yeah, I think, um... One thing uh, I would love everybody to think about is, um, are you using your uh, best skills uh, today uh, the right way or to contribute to something that makes sense, that is meaningful? If the answer is yes, I'm so happy that you're there and, and you act. Um, and the, if the answer is no, maybe consider you know spending a moment and checking out Tech to the Rescue, if you're a technology person, a product designer, uh, or uh, you know, developer, manager, CSR manager in the company that has uh, access to engineering talent, product talent. Um, but also you can search for other organizations, uh, you know, the marketing to the rescue or, or you know, uh, uh, lawyer to the rescue, right? Like uh, there is actually an organization called Trust Law uh, which is a benchmark for us who is doing similar thing like us, but in the legal industry, which is very natural for legal industry to do pro bono. And in tech, it just starts to roll. So the question again, are you using your best skills the way that could help, uh, you know, uh, make a change in the world? If you would like to just try to uh, think where you could do that. Uh, there are ways and we can also help you to decide how to do that the best way we, we we do that and probably that's my recommendation just think uh what you're good at and uh you know life is um uh, fairly short and to uh, use it the best way um it's worth spending it on you know something that makes us passionate and, and motivated and um i'm telling you there are thousands of people that could, uh, you know, uh, appreciate your support uh, with what you know uh, how to do, and you're good at it. So, Daniel, thank you for spending the time uh, with me today to explain your journey and your passion and your commitment. You're definitely a serial entrepreneur, and you're making positive change through the world. So, thank you for sharing all of your insights with my audience. 
Thank you, Stephen. And thank you for also being the ambassador of using technology for good. Uh, we need people like you to actually, you know, push the needle and move it in the direction of, you know, economy of empathy, where people actually not only make profit, but also make impact. Uh, and the technology is a significant uh, area that can really make a difference. So thanks for that. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.